Buffalo Beer Co. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Molly Martin, and I am a JNF Future Hanukkah Committee member, as well as a member of the JNF Future Board. If you're joining us for your first JNF Future event, I'd like to take just a few minutes to tell you a bit about JNF. So for decades, the Jewish National Fund of Canada has cared for the land of Israel. This mission took the role of planting trees, building water reservoirs, preserving natural habitats, and building parks and bicycle trails. Recently, JNF Canada has taken on projects to strengthen the social infrastructure within Israel. Um, these projects benefit Israel's vulnerable populations, at-risk youth, victims of domestic abuse, children with special needs, veterans, and the poor. In other words, JNF Canada directs your donation dollars to where they are needed the most. Today's program is brought to you by JNF Future. JNF Future is the Young Professionals Group of JNF, the Jewish National Fund, catering to the under 80, the under 40 age group. We plan a variety of events throughout the year with all proceeds going to a project in Israel. For the past few years, the JNF Future Board has been raising funds for Jaffa Dalad after school education and enrichment center in Tel Aviv, Israel's program expansion. The center provides educational, nutritional, recreational, and therapeutic support to at-risk children and teenagers, 70% of whom are of Ethiopian descent. While the center currently serves 30 children, there remains a critical need within the community to assist additional children and teenagers, as well as their families. The neighborhood in which the center operates is one of the most deprived and poverty-stricken areas in Israel, with 50% of the population living below the poverty line. 53% of the children in this area drop out of school before completing the 12th grade. To address these challenges, the money being raised for our events will help to expand programs to help marginal marginalized children and teenagers at Jaffa Dalid to enjoy the benefit of the Jaffa Dalid enrichment programs. So to those of you who are able to make a donation for tonight's project, or for tonight's program, thank you for helping us and Jaffa Dalid stay on track with the program expansion. Thank you, Molly. Uh, I'm Jordan Waldman, also a member of the Fanica Committee and a co-chair of JNF Future Toronto Board. Uh, I'll be your moderator for the evening. We're going to ask that uh, for tonight, we keep everybody on mute. And if you do have questions and comments, uh, please type it into the chat and I'll be able to direct it to our uh, our host and uh, we will have a schmooze in the middle where we'll ask you to turn your mics on and, and hang out and make some comments and and get to meet the other attendees and then we'll also have a schmooze at the end of the evening as well. Um, so again questions in the chat any comments please let us know you can send it to me directly or to uh, the public through the chat. A little bit about Shiloh Beer Company. Uh, Shiloh Beer is based in Ottawa. Uh, produces premium award-winning beer for the Ontario craft and kosher market. Uh, it was founded in 2014 by husband and wife team Jamie and Ben Shiloh. Uh, they have an extensive background in hospitality, beverage, so and event planning. That's why. Your volume. There we go. Uh, Jamie, who will be leading tonight's program, is the vice president and brewmaster. Uh, Jamie developed her knowledge and passion for beer working in some of Toronto's best craft beer bars, including Bar Volo and Beer Bistro. Uh, she studied brewing at Niagara College's Brewmaster and Brewery Operations Management Program. Shiloh Beer Co Company will be op opening their own kosher certified brewing facility in Ottawa in spring of next year. So without further ado, I would like to pass it over to Jamie to get us started. I'm unmuted. Everyone can hear me. Yay. Welcome, everybody. Um, I see some of you have your cameras turned on. Some of you don't. If you really don't want to, that's cool. Um, if you feel comfortable, please keep your cameras on. Um, I, I've never done anything like this before over, over Zoom online through a screen. Um, beer seminars tend to be very interactive. Um, there's always lots of chatter, especially as people get drunker throughout the tasting. Um, so, so it will it will definitely help me be able to to interact with you um, if you feel comfortable sharing your face with the room. Um, also, um, if anyone is is comfortable throughout the the tasting, um, please use the the chat um, if you have questions. 
Um, and I'm really hoping that people will feel comfortable to share uh, their comments and experiences through the chat. Um, so I have a long history of working in the restaurant industry. And what I loved about working in restaurants, I really got into food, got into beverages. Um, for a while I was working in sort of higher end fine dining types of atmosphere. And um, I really like wine. Uh, but what I didn't like about those types of places that there seems to be a lot of arrogance and snobbery that comes along with attaining these higher levels of knowledge when it comes to, to food and beverage. Um, you know, I, I, there's definitely certain toxic environments in, in the restaurant industry that are, uh, that are hard to deal with. And I also, I always, I always found that very, very off-putting, you know, for, for people who come in and they wanna, they wanna try new things. Um, they wanna start learning about, about things um, that they've never had before. You know, they may have, have, have tried a wine, like a cheap wine that they really like. They wanna expand their knowledge. Um, it's very off-putting when you go in and you and you meet someone who's who's a real snob about about teaching teaching you about what they know. Um, so eventually, I found myself working at a bar um, called Barvolo, and this was back before it was the it became the icon that it is now. Um, so we're talking thirteen years ago, probably. Um, Craft beer was sort of just starting to really take off in Toronto. Um, so this was basically just this little place with an amazing beer list. Um, the owners were just really cool people. It was a family run restaurant. They had an amazing beer selection and the staff was just really interested in sharing knowledge with people. They shared a lot of knowledge with me. Um, even more than that, the customers, they, there was all these regular customers that just loved beer. Um, they loved sharing their knowledge. Um, I learned a lot from, from talking to customers and serving people beer. Um, and there's just so much more of like a humility about it and a, and a willingness to, to teach people who are coming in, people who are coming in new to the subject of beer. So that really set the standard for me for my whole approach to when I talk about beer, um, I love teaching people about beer, but I like making it accessible. You know, I don't like the snobbery and the arrogance that, that, that some people uh, tend to get into. You know, I always like to tell people, um, if you can eat and drink, then you have all the skills that you need to start learning about food and beverage. You know, there's nothing special required. Um, so I thought that would be kind of my theme for, for this evening um, is really to just have, have an experience um, and to start developing a little bit of a beer vocabulary. Um, there's no test, there's no, they're like, this is supposed to be nice and informal. Um, you don't have to memorize anything. I didn't, I didn't provide sheets or anything. Um, I just want people to learn and have, and have a bit of a beer experience. Um, so I want you to um, trust your own senses. I want you to feel empowered to, to know that your experience is correct. I hate giving tasting notes to people when people ask for tasting notes on my beers because what I taste in a beer is not necessarily what you're gonna taste in a beer. Your experience is 100% true and correct. Um, and I want everyone to feel, to feel comfortable sharing that. So um, as we go things, as we go through the beers tonight. Um, please feel comfortable typing in what you what you taste, what you smell, uh, what you perceive. Um, little sip of water. Um, so I think JNF sent everyone a package that includes somebody's holding up a note. <laughs> no, okay. Um, JNF sent you a package uh, with some snacks. Um, you're welcome to just stick with the beer or if you want to have, uh, have some snacks because um, I'm going to talk a little bit about beer and food pairing. Um, I think they, I didn't get the package myself. Um, they sent you some chips, some other, some other things. Um, I've got some chips and crackers and cookies myself, whatever you have on hand. Um, 
is good. If you have a steak dinner there, by all means, you know, let us know how it is. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to give you seven words tonight to, to, to start developing your beer vocabulary. Um, the first four words are just the ingredients of beer. We have water, malt, yeast, and hops. And I'm going to go through those as, as we go through the four beers. Um, the other three words have to do with beer and food pairing. Uh, so those are cut, complement, and contrast. And these words actually come from Roger Mittag. Roger Mittag is the person who developed the uh, beer sommelier program. It's called Prudhomme. It's based in Canada. Um, so when he talks about beer and food pairing, he uses these three terms. Um, complement means matching flavors. The interesting thing about beer is that you can quite often find similar flavors in beer as there are in food. Um, so an example of this, I've got I have a seven month old, so I've got arrowroot baby crackers, baby cookies on hand. Um, so those are gonna have a biscuity flavor. There's a good chance that I could find a biscuity flavor in one of the beers tonight. So that would be a good example of a compliment, finding the same flavors. Um, the other one is contrast, which is where you have two different flavors working together. The best example of that I can think of off the top of my head, if you've ever had a salted caramel, where you have salty and sweet coexisting in your mouth, and it's a much different experience than having just salt or, or just sugar, right? There's, there's two things and they're working together to, uh, to do something interesting. Uh, the third thing is cut, which is where the beer comes in and basically washes away the food. Um, so basically like a palate cleanser. Um, any questions before we, we get started into, into beer? Feel free to type things in. All right, so we might as well get started. First beer we're going to do is the Panitza Pilsner. This guy. <laughs> My husband is sneaking by with uh, with the baby. All right, so Panitza Pilsner. So um, Panitza is um, a contract brewery. That means that they don't have their own facility. They own their recipe. They sell their own beer. Um, they have their beer produced for them at Junction Brewing, which is in Toronto. Um, it's owned by Marcelo Panitza, who was an award-winning home brewer. Um, I'm not sure if they have plans to, to open their own brewery or not. Um, the style is a German style Pilsner. Um, so Pilsner, Pilsner literally means from the town of Pilsen, which is where this style of beer originated. Um, you can go ahead and start tasting. You don't have to wait for me to tell you when to drink. <laughs> I see everyone at once. Um, so um, the style originated in, uh, in Czech, in the town of Pilsner. Um, and then this being a German style Pilsner means that it, uh, it's slightly differentiated from the original. Um, so in the 1870s, the Germans basically adapted their own uh, Pilsners to be just a little bit drier, a little bit crisp, more crisp um, and a little more bitter than, than Czech style Pilsners. Every lager, um, is basically um, a progression from the original Czech Pilsner. So this is kind of like one step over from, from the original. Um, give it a little taste. So this beer is, is where I wanted to talk about water, which is the, the main ingredient in beer. Um, water is not very interesting when it comes to a consumer level of, of understanding. Um, it's definitely very interesting for me as a brewer, 
because water is not just H2O, it's, it's got a whole lot of other things. If you've ever looked up the drinking water analysis for Toronto, um, it's like two pages long. There's just tons and tons of stuff, all these different um, trace minerals and, and things that are in water. And those are things that we have to consider as brewers because all those extra ingredients, all those extra trace minerals do things to my beer ingredients. Um, like I said, as a consumer, it's not super interesting. Other than the fact that there are certain historical beer styles that came about because certain locations have certain types of water. Um, and the city of Pilsen is one of those locations. This style came about because the water that they have in Pilsen is almost completely pure. They have a very low level of, of any minerals. It's, it's um, very soft water um, in comparison to Toronto. Toronto has very hard water. Um, so they, they found that they were able to make a very, very clear, very bright, very, very crisp beer. Um, and that, that really influenced, uh, influenced beer making and beer styles. Um, the style also originated around the same time that glass was invented. Before, before then, um, a lot of people, everyone, um, were drinking out of uh, like ceramic beer steins. You couldn't actually see the beer other than what you saw at the top. So all of a sudden we have this beautiful, crisp, yellow, pale beer and you can actually see it. Um, so that had a lot to do with um, the popularity of, of the rise of, of this beer. Um, and of course we know lagers are the most popular style in, uh, in the world. Uh, most of the, the big macro beers um, are takeoffs of, of, of this kind of beer. So normally when we taste beer, um, the first thing we do is smell it. Uh, when you open a beer, it releases the carbonation um, and then that will, will release some aroma. So um, at the risk of sounding like a beer nerd, you wanna really get your nose in there. Does anyone wanna type in uh, into the chat what they, uh, what they might smell or taste in this? Banana? Great Pilsner, it is. I really enjoy this one. Wheat and citrus, fantastic. Yeast, okay, so kind of like um, when people say yeast, it makes me think bready. Very light and crisp. One of the things we also talk about with, um, with beer is mouthfeel. Um, the carbonation seems very high to me in this one. It's very effervescent, very fizzy. But definitely night, light and, and crisp and, uh, and thirst quenching. Um, so going back to our, our food pairing uh, vocabulary words, um, this is a really good beer I find that, that cuts into things. Um, if any of you are trying um, one of your greasier snacks like the potato chips, the, the carbonation, the bubbles in this, will cut into the grease. They will, they will wash away the, uh, the oil. This is really the reason why um, fast food restaurants all serve carbonated beverages. Um, pop is, is very cheap. It would be cheaper if they didn't put gas in it. The reason that they put CO2 in these beverages is because it helps to wash away that grease and helps you eat more of their greasy food. Um, nice and light. Does everyone like this beer? Lots of nodding. So they, they recommend pairing this with sushi, pizza, fried foods.
And someone else is saying it's pretty meh, which is fantastic because not everyone likes the same things. Anyone have any questions so far? Has I anyone, have, sorry? I have a question for you. Um, you. You were talking about the difference between a beer stein and a glass. I'm wondering if the, uh, the glass or the mug or the shape does that make a difference to eventually how the beer is going to taste? It can. There, there are a lot of debates on to what extent, um, but there are, so a lot of different, hang on one second, see if I have an example. So a lot of beer, beer glass styles have evolved um, with certain intentions to do certain things. Um, a lot of people are familiar with, with this one. This is called a nonic pint glass. Um, this is designed with this little thing. And this is, um, the origin of this is British. It's basically to help you hold onto your glass while you're standing around in the pub. So it is nice and functional. Um, it doesn't necessarily change the, the perception of the beer, but it, it, does, it does add to the experience in that sense. Um, there are some, I don't have one clean with me right now. Um, there's some beer glasses, you see this a lot with Belgian styles that are round, but they would have a stem on them like a brandy glass. Um, and that would be because those beers are meant to be drunk a little bit warmer. So you hold them in your hand um, and, and they warm up. And, and then that also changes the experience. Um, so yes, definitely this, the shape of the glass can serve different purposes. If it's not made in pills, what makes it a pilsner and not just a light lager? Um, so usually people will use the name pilsner because they are, they are making it in that style. Um, often when a beer is called a light lager, they've tried to make it lighter than a Pilsner. Pilsners are generally supposed to have a little bit more, a little bit more body to them, a little bit more character than a light lager. A light lager is basically another progression of the style of Pilsner. Um, a lot of brewers outside of Europe that are making Pilsners will still use European ingredients. So they'll use um, German or Czech malts or hops or, or whatnot to try to get as close as possible. Um, as brewers, we can also play with our water. Um, like I said, in Toronto has very hard water and in order to make a Pilsner, you need very soft, very pure water. So a brewer might get a reverse osmosis system to basically purify their water to completely neutral. Um, and then they can, they can add stuff in depending on what beer style they want to make. Has anyone tried the beer with, um, with any of your snacks? Do you notice any, anything that goes together, anything that doesn't go together? Do you find that the carbonation uh, wipes away the grease from the potato chips? Do you notice a difference between drinking from a can or the glass? Um, definitely when you have the glass, you're able to smell it as you're drinking it, which is very important. Um, and when you drink from a can, um, the inside of the can has a coating on it to protect, um, beer is acidic, so it protects the can from, uh, the can taste, the metallic taste from getting into the beer, um, but the outside of the can doesn't have that kind of a protective coating on it, so you will kind of taste metal if you, if you drink right out of a can.
Is everyone ready to move on to the next beer? Yay, okay. So the next beer is gonna be the Ephis Oatmeal Brown Ale. This one. So with this beer, I wanted to talk about the second ingredient, which is malt. When we say malt, we're talking about malted barley usually. Barley is usually the main grain that we use for, for making beer, um, but we can use a lot of other grains. This one also has oatmeal in it. Um, some of the beers I make, I use rye, some have wheat. Um, there's a lot of interesting uh, other things brewer brewers are doing these days as well with uh, some gluten-free grains like sorghum and, and different things. Um, so one of the things that malt does um, for beer is it gives it color. Um, the last beer we had was very yellow. This one is very clearly brown. Um, and that brown color does come from the malt. So they've obviously used some darker malts to make this one. Good beer for breakfast, yes. This is sweet, yes. So um, malt is where the sugar comes from. In beer, basically, when we when we make beer, we soak the grain in hot water. Grain is full of starch because starch is a food source for the seed, which is supposed to grow into a plant. Um, but when we make beer, uh, we basically take advantage of the the starch that is in in the grain. We let it sit in hot water and turn it into sugar, and then we ferment that sugar into alcohol. Um, so there, there is residual sugar and, and that's from the malt and that's why some beers are more sweet than others. So a little bit about this brewery. Um, Left Field Brewery is, um, they actually started off as a contract brewery and now they have their own facility. They're located in Leslieville. Um, one of the owners, it's a husband and wife team, one of the owners um, actually went to the Niagara College Brewing Program, the same as I did. He was uh, in the first class though, two years ahead of me. Um, they are obviously very into baseball. So all of their marketing, all of their beers are all tied in with this baseball, baseball theme. Um, I love their marketing. I think it's really, really cute, really clever. Um, so I guess EFIS is some type of a pitch. I don't know baseball. I'm, I'm not familiar with a lot of these terms. Um, but I guess it's a, it's a style of some way of pitching the baseball. Um, what else do we have here? I think that's, uh, is anyone getting any interesting flavors out of this one? Chocolate and coffee, excellent. Ephus is a high arc, low speed pitch. I figured somebody, so there would be at least one baseball person in here. There's a question here. Uh, what is the difference between a brown ale, a stout, and a porter? So the easiest way is, I guess, levels of darkness. Um, porter is going to be darker than a brown ale, um, generally more more roast flavors, more coffee flavors. Um, and then a stout is is supposed to be even more even more roasted coffee, maybe even burnt flavors um, and maybe even a heavier body. There's another question here about uh, actually pouring your beer. Uh, mm -hmm. Is it true that if you pour it rougher, you'll be less bloated when drinking the beer. So the more you agitate it when pouring, the more you're going to release the carbonation. Um, so yeah, the less carbonation you end up swallowing, then the less, the less you will feel. 
feel bloated. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, gas, gas is unstable. I don't know if we have many scientists in the group. Um, gas is not stable. It's, it's under pressure when it's in the container. As soon as you release, as soon as you open the container and you hear that's, that's gas coming out. Um, and then once you pour it, um, the gas is going to start coming out slowly and slowly. If you let it sit for a while, eventually your beer will be flat. Um, so yeah, and I mean, you can see the difference between if I pour it slowly, I'm not getting much. If I pour it and really agitate it, the, the bubbles start foaming up and, uh, and all the head comes out. Jamie, I noticed this beer has 5.5% uh, alcohol versus the first one was 5%. Is there a, a reason why a brewery or brewmaster would, uh, you know, adjust the, the alcohol level? So a lot of um, alcohol levels come along with the style. Usually every beer style has a range um, and a lot of, a lot of sort of the, like the regular beers are usually in the five to six, five to six and a half kind of range that would kind of like a regular strength beer. Um, if you want to brew a lighter beer, then you, then you, then you go for a, a lower alcohol. Um, loggers and pilsners tend to be in, in like the four to five percent alcohol range. Um, as I mentioned, the, the alcohol comes from fermenting the sugars that were from the grains. So if you want to make a stronger beer, you use more grain. If you want to make a, a lower alcohol beer, you use less grain. Less sugar means less alcohol. Cool. So this is a good one um, I find to, um, first of all, brown eyes are really, really great for food pairing um, because there's so much that just works really well with food. If you ever just want a classic go-to beer for a uh, for dinner, brown ale is, is a really great choice um, because they tend to have a little bit of a sweetness to them. Um, not always, uh, this one does have a nice sweetness to it. Um, food tends to be a little more on the salty side. So you've got that contrast of, of sweet and salty. Um, also there's, there's flavors here in this, in this style of beer that we can often find you can match in food. This would be a really nice beer, I think with a steak, something that's grilled and has some of those kind of darker caramelized flavors. Um, I think that would, that would be a nice complement with, uh, with sort of like the roasted chocolate notes that go in the beer. have here it reminds me of a guinness okay i can see that because they're going to have some similar uh dark malts absolutely um some say don't drink carbonated beverages on a plane because the low pressure allows it to expand inside of you but they always serve pop on planes i'd be more worried about the actual can exploding on a plane than than it being in my stomach. Uh, good question. So someone's asking um, what drives how high or low the IBU is. Uh, so somebody's getting a little uh, into more of the advanced stuff. IBU refers to uh, how bitter a beer is. It stands for International Bitterness Units. Um, so there is a measurement of how bitter a beer can be. Um, and that comes from the hops. We're going to get into the hops with, uh, with the last beer. So maybe I'll talk about that a little bit more when we get there. Um, with wine tasting, you go from dry reds to whites to mid to sweeter dessert wines. Is there a suggested progression for beer? Um, yes. So there are people actually that compare lagers to white wines and ales to red wines. Uh, I don't. I don't tend to agree with that because there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of different things that are not taken into consideration with that kind of thing. Um, but generally, yes, you want to go you know from lighter to heavier. 
um, from less bitter or more sweet to, to more bitter. Um, because as you get into the stronger tasting things, your palate is going to adjust itself. Um, if you save some of your Pilsner and try it again after we do the last beer, um, you're going to have a totally different experience with it. It's going gonna, it's gonna to taste a lot more light um, and you might not be able to detect like the really finer complexities um, that we could taste uh, going in with a fresh palate. Um, so absolutely. Um, and that's what I've structured here is, is to start kind of lighter and, and go a bit heavier as we go. The Pilsner following the EFIS actually makes it taste better. Bitter. Better or bitter? Better. Um, so that depends on what you didn't like about the Pilsner and how it's different. Pilster had no taste. So now you're, you're finding, you're picking up on something that you didn't before. Yeah, and that's that's the interesting thing about our, our palates is everything you've eaten or drank up until the point of trying something is going to affect your perception. Um, there's a lot that affects your perception. Um, the weather affects, affects how you perceive a beer. You know, you're gonna, if you're sitting on a hot, a hot patio in you know Toronto humidity, and and I give you a really heavy stout, you're not going to enjoy that. You're gonna you're gonna perceive it to be gross compared to if I give you a stout on like a cold winter's day. Um, you know, if you've had coffee recently, um, if you've eaten something, everything everything kind of affects your your palate and your perception and your experience. Um, so yeah, and that's, that's interesting when you go back and forth and, and see how different beers affect each other. Um, also if you've been eating, that's going to affect how you, how you perceive, perceive a beer once you go back to it. Well, if, uh, if there's no other questions about these two beers, uh, perhaps we'll do our little 10-minute uh, intermission, uh, give everybody a chance to uh, cleanse the palate, so to speak, have a little uh, drink of water or something, uh, bathroom break if you need it, or if you just want to hang out. Rhythm and Bruce have the Weizen. Um, I actually was not able to get this beer, so I don't have it. Um, I have a substitute for myself, which is the same style, just a different brand. Um, so I'll be drinking a half of bites in the one with you. Um, so feel free to crack that one. So Rhythm and Brews Brewery is in Cambridge. Uh, the owner is Andrew Beyer. He comes from an extensive home brewing background. He's also a national beer judge. Um, and he's a firefighter. So my beer is, is the, same, uh, the same style, um, but it's actually from Germany, it's Weinstefaner. The style originated in Germany, um, if you can't tell by the name Hefeweizen. Um, Hefeweizen literally means yeast wheat. Um, so the, the big qualities in this beer are gonna come from the wheat, which is, uh, which is the malt, um, and also the yeast. Um, so that brings us to our third beer ingredient, the yeast. The yeast is what converts the sugar from, from the malt, from the grain, into alcohol. It's what actually does the work of making beer. Brewers don't make beer, we just provide an environment for all the little microorganisms to do their job. 
So I assume yours probably looks like mine. Hefeweizens are usually very cloudy. That comes from a combination of the wheat and also the, uh, the yeast. Um, they're usually unfiltered, so you're gonna see a lot of uh, cloudy yeast qualities in them. Um, they tend to be very effervescent, very fizzy, um, again, from the yeast. Can anyone tell me what they smell or taste in this one? There's two, there's two classic flavors and aromas that come from Hefeweizen, um, specifically from the yeast. Um, yeast, when they're, when they're doing their job of, of converting sugar into alcohol, they also create all these other byproducts um, that add flavor to beer. Fruity? Yes, banana. So banana is the one, one of the classic flavors that you get out of uh, cloves. Thank you, perfect. You guys are great. Banana and clove are, are the two things that normally Hefeweizens are known for. Um, and there's no flavor added to this beer. This is just a four main ingredient beer. Germans are very, very strict about their, their four ingredient beers. There, there have been laws in Germany that you cannot brew beer using anything else. Um, there are some craft brewers now that, that play around with beers, but they're very, they're very strict about their, uh, their four ingredient beers. So, so um, the, the banana and clove come from the yeast, which is kind of interesting because you do get a lot of those flavors um, and there's, there's no actual banana or spices added to this beer. So one person is saying it's kind of sour. I can definitely see a little bit of a tartness. Someone's about to say banana bread, definitely. Grapefruit. Yeah, definitely citrus flavors. Sometimes this beer can have bubblegum flavors to it. Um, that's generally considered a bit more of a fault. You don't generally aim to have bubblegum in your, in your Hefeweizen. Um, but it does happen sometimes. And very fizzy, like mine still has a nice, nice foam on it. How is the, how is the rhythm and brews have a bites in? Do people like it? Not so many people nodding. <laughs> okay, no. Some people like it, some people not quite sure. Some thumbs up. Has anyone tried this with any of their snacks? So I'm trying one of these um, these are from Walmart, cheese flavored snack crackers. Um, I think the, the effervescence of the beer really cuts into the horrible artificial cheese flavor for me. Fantastic. Tried the prior two after having it and they now taste flat. Yeah, because this one is so, so fizzy and the other two are going to be, be perceived. They've also been sitting out. So a little bit of the, of the carbonation would have gone down. Um, but yeah, definitely what you've had before changes your perception. Um, somebody's getting tipsy. Perfect. Nobody has to drive home. Probably the one benefit of doing this over Zoom is that uh, everyone is safe at home and no one has to drive. Are Ritz cheese crackers still a thing? Ritz is not kosher, so I don't know. Um, I've seen like the, uh, I think they still have like the cheese sandwich mini ones, but. 
I don't know, it's been so long since I've, since I've had Ritz. Um, for some reason, a lot of the Walmart brand great value stuff um, has Hectors on it, which is kind of cool. So I buy, I buy the snacks for my kids. Jamie, I have a quick question about pouring your beer. Mm -hmm. So if your, your can is a, a tall boy can and your, your glass can only fit half the beer, Mm -hmm. or you're only going to drink half the beer now and then you want a little bit later, should you pour the whole beer or leave it in the can as an example to maybe help keep it a little better in the can or should we pour it all in the glass and, and let it sit in the glass? How long are you going to wait to finish it? Yeah, well, let's say, you know, you're, you're sitting down for dinner and you pour half a can now, but now should you leave half of it for dessert or should you pour the whole thing? it's up to you i mean it's it's still gonna lose a little bit of carbonation as if it's sitting in the can probably will lose less um you can always keep the second half cold if you want um or you can let it warm up it's there's uh, there's there's no rules when it comes to to what you want to do you know i find in the in the wine world there there's always seems to be so many like rules about what you should and shouldn't do and how you should and shouldn't have things um, do what you want. I don't know. I don't know if, if the, I, I usually pour the whole thing and then have a second one for dessert, but just perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever works for you. Um, I, there's, there's some beers that have, um, have yeast sediment in them. I like to, to pour the first half clear. And then the second half, I like to agitate the bottle a little bit. So some of that yeast gets stirred up and, and have the second half with the yeast in it. So it's a matter of preference. Um, you know, do what works for you, do what you like. That's, that's my rule anyways. I don't know if that's, you know, maybe, maybe some brewers, some beer experts would totally disagree with me and that's fine too. Any questions about um, the beer, the style? Has anyone noticed their beer, um, how it goes or doesn't go with any of the snacks that they're having? Oh, I think someone had asked if this, um, what, what would this beer pair with? Um, I think it could go really good with, uh, with cheese. Um, maybe some salads. I would go with lighter foods. Nice with the popcorn. Cool. Pair it with fish, that could be interesting. I would maybe probably try it more with a white fish. Um, could be interesting with salmon as well. Pretzels. Didn't, this is a great comment. Didn't realize the banana until you mentioned. And this is why I love when people um, share their experience because often you'll you'll taste something and you'll be like, "Wow, I, you know, what is that flavor? I know what it is. I know what it is." And it's not till someone else says banana that you're like, "Yes, banana." Um, so that's why I love tasting in groups and having people just just say what you're say what you're getting because somebody else is probably getting that too. Um, and sometimes we don't. We can't name it until until someone actually says it, and then it then it makes perfect sense. Would I pair it with a pear? Try it. Why not? The worst thing that can happen if you pick a bad pairing is it doesn't taste good and you don't do it again. Uh, 
It doesn't smell or taste like natural banana. It tastes like Laffy Taffy banana. So here's the interesting thing. The actual chemical um, that is created by yeast that tastes like banana in this beer is called isoamyl acetate. You don't need to remember that, um, but isoamyl acetate is banana flavor. And often when you get banana, banana medicine, banana popsicles, banana candy, um, it will contain isoamyl acetate um, to add that banana flavor. The bananas that we currently get in the grocery store don't contain isoamyl acetate. So it's a flavor that tastes like banana, but bananas don't actually contain that chemical ingredient. Just some banana trivia for you. You can impress your friends now. Yes, isoamyl acetate will be on the test. You're going to have to draw like the actual chemical uh, picture of it. Toothpaste. Toothpaste is generally a hard, a hard food to pair. Absolutely. I think mint in general. Ben, does anything go with mint? Yes. Asking my peanut gallery. So my husband yeah. is a, is a trained sommelier. So when it comes to to wine and food pairing, wow. he's he's the expert. Mint goes with lamb. There you go. So you could do a nice uh, toothpaste sauce for your lamb. <laughs> I'm not a lamb fan, so that's outside of my Chocolate, my realm of strawberry, interest. Strawberry, watermelon. I'll go with mint. There you go. Are there common flavors that are integrated into beers? Are there any flavors that have tried to be integrated that we wouldn't expect? Um, salt is an interesting one. Um, there's a style of beer called Goes or Gosa, spelled G-O-S-E. Um, the style originates in a place that has a high sodium content in the water. So that adds an interesting, interesting effect to, to beer. You wouldn't normally think of brewing a beer with salty water. Um, but that almost gives it like a sour, not like a nice citrusy sour, almost like a briny sourness. Is everyone ready to move on to the last beer? Save the best for last um, because it's mine. Um, the girl on the front is not supposed to be me. It's just a coincidence. Even though I was a waitress for a long time. So the style of this beer is black IPA. Um, it is designated as a strong beer because it's six and a half percent. This is determined by the LCBO. Um, you have to label your beer according to what they decide is a beer versus strong beer versus extra strong beer. So this fell into the category of strong beer. Um, and this is an interesting one. I, I reserved this one to talk about hops, um, but there's gonna be a lot of malt character in this beer as well. Obviously it's very dark. So there's gonna be a lot of uh, roasted and, and dark malt types of flavors in it. Um, but in comparison to the Ephus brown ale that we had, you should notice quite a difference in, in this one. I mean, there's, there's a very similar look in, in the color of the Ephus and the, and the black IPA. Right off the bell, you can, right off the bat, I'm smelling I'm smelling some roasted malts and I'm also smelling a little bit of a herbal quality. Um, so hops are the final ingredient that I wanted to talk about. Um, hops are, um, it's a plant, they're basically flowers, they're cone shaped little flowers that grow on a vine. And they're added to beer for a number of reasons. Um, they do act as a preservative. Um, they also contain resins and essential oils. The resins are what add bitterness to beer. Um, and that is added to balance out some of the sweetness that we get from malt. 
Um, and then the essential oils that are in hops are, are to add flavor and aromas. A lot of the essential oils in hops are um, either chemically similar or chemically identical to the substances that you find in different fruits, different plants, different flowers, um, grass, um, different things. So a lot of the, uh, the things you get out of hops in a beer, um, it's because it is, it is the same chemical that you're, that you're smelling or tasting. Um, so like I said, this is my beer. Um, I'm still contract brewing for now. So this one is being made right now at Junction in Toronto. Um, and we are in the process of opening our own facility in Ottawa, just waiting for our construction permit. Um, Amy, there's a question of where we can buy your beer. This one right now is at the LCBO. Um, so if you go on the LCBO website, find the beer, and then you have an option to, uh, to select, um, see what stores, what stores carry it. Um, we are COR certified. Um, we will continue to be COR certified. Was COR difficult to deal with to get a Heckscher? I love this question because there is, there's such a perception that, that, uh, Cush root supervision is is difficult. I think it depends a lot on where you stand on on kosher. Um, for people that keep kosher um, and really see see the value and and want to do it, um, you kind of understand that it can get very complex. There are rules that you have to follow, um, but ultimately it's worth it. I think people that just have the hexer because they feel like they have to um that kind of makes the rules a little harder to to follow um also the rules for cash root are different depending on what you're doing if i was shechting chickens i would have to have somebody there every single day um for us having a hexer on our beer it's a lot more just like a health inspection um i have to just email cor all of the um, ingredients that I use. So, so all of the malt already has, um, a kosher certificate. I just have to tell them which, which company I'm buying malt from. Um, hops, I don't think are a concern at all. They don't need to see a certificate for those. Um, yeast is again, not a concern and, and water is water. So for us, it's really, really easy. Once I get into doing flavored beers, um, again, they're going to want to see certificates, um, for what I'm using. Um, and then it's just a matter of every so often they'll send one of the rabbis in to, to do a site visit and, and kind of poke around, make sure that they're not like throwing lobsters into the tank. Um, um, yeah, it's, it's really not, uh, it's not difficult. Um, you know, we, you do pay a fee for the service because these, these are people that, um, are doing this as a job. Um, so it's, it's not, it's not free. It's not necessarily cheap. Um, I think it is worth it for us, especially because we want to, we want to get into doing, um, interesting flavored beers. Um, my raspberry beer, like I mentioned, um, it's not available right now. Um, but when it was available, it was the only kosher fruit beer in Canada. Um, I don't know what else I can say about, uh, about kosher food. You know, it's, it's different for everything. If I was making cheese or if I was running a seafood plant, it would be, it would be a lot, a lot different. Um, for us, for beer, it's, yeah, it's not too, uh, not too difficult. Um, we do have to sell our hummets during Pesach. So again, the COR calls us up and reminds us to, to make the arrangement. Um, COR have satellite people that they work with in different places. So um, we have a hashkacha here in Ottawa called the Ottawa, the Ottawa VAD, the OVH. Um, and Rabbi Teitelbaum that does the supervision um, for his own Hashkaha will also supervise on behalf of COR, I think also MK and OU. Um, so he will we'll be working with our local guy um, in order to, to have COR supervision right here in Ottawa. 
Um, and when we have to sell our hametz at Pesach, we, we meet with someone local here and we basically just sign a form. We sell our hametz the same that we do um, with our household, our household hametz. Basically the business sells its hametz for the week of Pesach. I guess we should talk about the beer. What does everyone, does it, does anyone get um, any hop qualities that they're noticing? Do you find this one is definitely a little more bitter than, than some of the other ones? Coffee, definitely coffee. I get the bitterness and then when I go back to like the Ephus Brown Ale or the other ones, they taste very sweet in comparison. Smells like metal. Okay, that's fair. Um, yeah, there might be something something that you're getting a mineral quality out of. Absolutely. How come more Schiller beers were not part of the package? Because I don't have any. Um, one of the downfalls of contract brewing is that it's very expensive um, and I have to brew in the size of a batch of whatever my host brewery has. So it's a 25 hectoliter system, which means I have to make um, 2,500 liters at a time. Um, so having a whole selection of, of many different beers is just not possible. Um, when I open my brewery, it's going to be a uh, 12 hectoliter, so about half the size. So I can brew a lot more different, different things. Um, we will be able to ship across the province. So we're gonna have lots of stuff available. Um, we'll try to get more things into the LCBO as well, hopefully different seasonal, so we can have lots of different flavors and lots of different styles um, out there. Um, the interesting thing as well is because we work with the LCBO, we can put um, anything into the grocery stores as long as, as long as they have them. So once we, once we have our brewery, once we have lots of styles that aren't um, in the LCBOs, that gives us a little bit more of um, a, uh, a selling feature to go to, especially the kosher grocery stores that sell beer and say, hey, we've got um, these great kosher, interesting styles um, and you've got the kosher market. So, so let's, let's get these products in. If I could have, I would have given you all four Shiloh beers. I just don't have them yet. Um, but some of these, some of these breweries, Panitza, um, we do work with, we have a side, a kind of a side hustle of, um, helping breweries get LCBO listings. So Panitza Pilsner is one of the ones that we work with there. Um, also Rhythm and Brews we work with, um, the, uh, the Ephus was actually a substitute. There was another beer that, um, delivery just didn't quite work out. Um, so I, I picked this, uh, this one because I, I really like the brewery, um, and because I do have that connection with, uh, with the guy who, um, who went to the same school that I did. The process of getting beer into the LCBO, um, first you have to basically just submit the, the product style, the basic information. Um, they have deadlines for different products throughout the year. So whether it's a seasonal or whether you want to get a year round listing, um, and then they, they look at what you submitted versus what they have versus all the other submissions and decide if they're interested. Um, the next level is, um, a tasting. Um, and then if they decide they are going to carry it, then you have to submit your label for approval. Um, they're very strict about what can and can't be on a label and what information has to be on it. We've had to, to change our label a number of times because they like to change the rules. 
Um, for example, this time of year is interesting. If there's any beers, um, there's a lot of beers that come especially from Belgium and Europe um, that are Christmas beers and we'll have like Santa Claus and you'll see a sticker across the Santa Claus because the LCBOs consider that advertising to children, uh, which is not okay. So usually uh, Christmas beers, if they have any of that kind of imagery, we'll have uh, stickers over the Santa, that's kind of funny. Um, and then after your label is approved, I think you have to submit a final product for um, a lab test because they want to make sure that your alcohol matches what it says the alcohol is on the can. Uh, again, if it doesn't match up, you'll see some beers in the LCBO have a sticker with, uh, with a different alcohol than what is printed on the can. Um, and then they send you a, a notice to purchase and then you're in. So nice, easy process. <laughs> It's not, we've submitted a number of things and gotten rejected because the LCBO is actually the number one seller of alcohol in the world. And they get millions of submissions of everything all the time, every year. It's actually really hard to get in. So the fact that we even have one spot on the shelf is, uh, is, uh, is an achievement. Um, hopefully we'll, we'll get more in the future when we have more products to offer. Um, good thing you don't boil it. There is boiling involved in, uh, in beer, but we don't have to talk about it. How do site visits work? Is, is that a question about cash root? Um, the rabbis just show up and, and have a look around and, and leave. I don't think they really do anything while they're there. All right. Are there uh, any other questions for for Jamie? Uh, I know Jamie and uh, and Shiloh Beer have been big supporters of JNF in the past. We had uh, Shiloh Beer at, at our golf tournament last year uh, in uh, 2019 when we were actually allowed to have the, the formal golf tournament. So thank you very much for having your product there. I know I loved it and I was looking forward to uh, drinking it again. Um, I see one other question just came in here. Can you sell directly since you are a brewery and then we can order online or directly to kosher caterers and so that we can ask caterers to supply you? So until I have a physical brewery, I'm not allowed to sell direct to consumers. That's just one of the weird al alcohol laws in Ontario are um, somewhat archaic. They've changed a little bit because of COVID, um, but not enough. So the day that I get my retail store authorization, I can start selling directly to consumers. I can and have sold to um, uh, like events. So a caterer who has a special occasion permit, I would be able to, to sell and deliver. And that's, that's how we've done uh, like the golf tournament, for example. Um, you know, we can, we can do things for for events, um, especially, actually, I think for a golf tournament, they probably already have a liquor license. And um, so it's, there's, there's things that we have to follow. Um, you know, we have, we have sold and supplied beer to, to shul events, because often you can kind of get a little bit of a, a wiggle room when it comes to, um, um, places of worship doing, um, doing events. Um, so we're not, you know, and we may have given a couple cans here and there to friends. Um, but yeah, once once we get our brewery launched, then we can we can sell direct. Amy, do you want to tell us a little bit about the other beers that you you make or will make that we haven't tried tonight? Um, so I mentioned the raspberry that um, it's a summer beer. Um, I use. I use real raspberries. I don't put flavors in it. Um, it's a pale ale base. And then I, we basically just buy tons and tons of raspberries and throw them into the fermenter and let it go. Um, so it's an, like a nice full raspberry flavor, but it is a pale ale base. So it still tastes like you're drinking a beer. It's not, uh, it's not just like a fruit juice. Um, another one I have, which is available in the LCBO for spring and summer is called Beer Snob. Uh, that is a Belgian style rye ale. Um, so it's a bit on the lighter side. It's got some interesting fruity characters, um, some yeast quality. Um, 
there might be some similar flavors to the uh, the Hefeweizen we tried because uh, Belgian yeasts have have some interesting characters to them. Um, until COVID hit, we had an exclusive beer at Beer Bistro um, because I worked there and I was working there when I went through school. Um, we came up with the idea of me doing an exclusive bespoke beer just for them. Um, so they were the only place that you could get it. And that was uh, an American brown ale. So kind of similar to the Ephus, not quite as sweet as, as the Ephus, um, but very similar in that it was just a nice food friendly, multi brown ale. Um, and then we've had a few one-offs. I did have a uh, more regular IPA um, that we did one batch of and sold through. Um, I had a porter that we did one batch of and sold through. Um, so I've got lots of ideas and lots of lots of plans. I think that covers everything that I've done so far. Awesome. Um, I will say, uh, you know, we are, we're getting close to nine o'clock. I will say thank you to everybody who's attended. Uh, we at JNF Future really do uh, appreciate your support. Uh, you know, we enjoy putting on these types of events that uh, we get uh, some insight, ha have some good times and raise money for uh, the Jaffa Dalit project, which is almost coming to completion. So again, thank you everybody for your donations. Uh, if you haven't donated, feel, please, please feel free to do so if you would like. Uh, thank you again to Jamie for all the insight, the education, and the beer. And uh, if anybody else wants to uh, hang around for a little bit, we, uh, we certainly can. We can keep the link open till 9.15, 9.30, and uh, hang out and schmooze and chat. And uh, otherwise, if you're signing off, thank you very much. Wish you a happy new year and all the best for 2021.